And also, thank you for talking ex exactly for 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we're now turning to Barbara Clarehue, who's going to be talking on a paper, a paper called They Were Going to Die Anyway, Challenging Ageism in Theatre. Now for something completely different. <laughs> Um, I, I, Max, I mean, I don't know how to follow that, <laughs> so um, bear, bear with me because this is a bit more standard. Um, I, um, I would like to start with the words of Indigenous scholar and writer Thomas King. And he starts all of his lectures by saying, the truth about stories is all we are is stories. So I'm going to tell you some stories today, and some of them are really hard. And it may be hard for me to talk about it. So if I break down, I'll come back. <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to assure you that when I am done, you are all going to be 10 minutes closer to death. <laughs> um, I was really intrigued by the questions posed of students, which concerns the role of art in the moment of crisis. And I think questioning whether art is a vehicle for working through trauma and guilt, shame, or maybe a way to understand horrific situations. Yes, I think we've heard that today. But what I was really interested in and thought about is that artists can be complicit in enhancing the harms associated with crises. Crises we have shaped through our art both as individuals and within our disciplines. And I suggest that theatrical practices, or what um, Jeffrey might have said are disciplines tribalism, contributed to the crisis of COVID-19 by marginalizing our elders. Let me offer you two stories. The first one I refer to as the great experiment of 2018, that year when I decided to go gray. Now, I've been gray since I was 24, but I decided to just let it all hang out. Um, and uh, in the process, I apparently became deaf, incontinent, technologically incapable, and generally confused, if not on the fast lane to dementia. Um, in, sh in stores and on the streets, I was less than. Once, when I was waiting for a bus, I must have been woman spreading on the sidewalk because a man came up from behind me, grabbed me by the shoulders, lifted me, and placed me in a different location. Younger people referred to my work and my artistic practice as keeping busy, and uh, before or after referring to me as dear, or occasionally sir. It was really difficult for me. It was a crisis of a personal nature. I had shifted from having an identity of an individual having power over and power with to a degendered nobody. I mean, on the upside, I did get the senior's discount I didn't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> I share this story to position myself as a researcher and declare my biases and motivations for the work that I want to do. Flash forward to 2020, when my hair was blondish again, and the pandemic made being old more than just a social inconvenience. My daughter is a medic in the Canadian Armed Forces, this is the hard part, and spent the summer of 2020 working in a long-term care facility trying to create order out of chaos. Her facility was capable of housing slightly over 260 residents. When she arrived, over 80 had died from COVID. What was more distressing, though, she revealed in very tearful phone calls, was that a similar number had died from dehydration, starvation, and failure to provide medical support. Out of fear and ignorance, low-paid support workers fled for their own safety, leaving one nurse and one personal care assistant to cover night shifts seven days a week. Residents lay in their rooms beside a dead roommate or spouse for hours, and in some cases days, before anyone removed the body. The remaining skeletal staff were forced to make decisions about who they could offer care and who they could not. While the media <clears throat> noted the number of individuals who passed away from COVID, none of them publicized those numbers of those who had died from the neglect. Those invisible victims illustrate the real tragedy 
of the pandemic. And I share this story with you to reveal my intention to research the performance of age, as Du Bois would have said, a passionate effort to do something tangible. Sorry, didn't mean to be so. Um, crises, can, crises can elicit compassion, but they can also evoke callousness. The COVID-19 pandemic starkly exposed ageist attitudes against older people, underscoring a very unsettling discourse about age and human worth that questioned the value of elders. During the pandemic, ageist comments and hate speech blamed older persons as a reason for lockdown. They were labeled as vulnerable, read, burdens to society. Many long-term care facilities experienced preventable, unnecessary, and negligent deaths. The basic human rights of many older adults were violated through lockdown restrictions on social interactions. Essentially, they were placed in a state of detention. And the sharp increase in the use of telemedicine without equivalent attention to digital literacy and access to digital technology impacted elders' access to health care. How did this happen? How did our society get to a place where older people could be so devalued? I would argue that humans fear death and the elderly abject body is a visual marker and reminder of the fact that we will all die. And this fear in turn drove indifference to the, towards those invisible communities most affected by the pandemic. But this was not a pandemic issue. In certain pockets of North American culture, we've been indifferent to older people for a long time. I would argue that performing arts has been complicit for years in rendering these humans invisible by making their aging bodies unwanted presences on stage or broadcast in digital format. My research suggests that in the Canadian professional theatre, only 5% of staged shows between 2015 and 2020 feature an older person as a character at all, much less as a lead. This, in a society, where 16% of the population is 65 or older. Where are their stories? Where are their bodies? Did this artistic silence contribute to the devaluation of older people before the pandemic, exacerbate or maybe even promote the way that older people are treated in much of Canada? Has theater reflected the social tendency to disregard or marginalize older people, or has theater's modern tribal tendency to ignore their stories and their aging bodies helped to reduce them to people who are just gonna die anyway? Regardless, many theater, as theater practitioners, we're rejecting a shared attribute of all humans that with each breath we take, we are aging. Age, I believe, is a culturally fabricated position within our social hierarchy and it's pegged to this linear concept of age. We're a number. But unlike many other discriminated cultural positions such as race, religion, national origin, gender, all humans age. Age is performed with each action of the human body, and as the body grows older, minute by minute, hour and day, every iteration of age is one step closer to confronting mortality and being stigmatized as elderly. In the best of times, the social result is a declining social position and discriminatory ageism such as I experienced in 2018. In the worst times, declining social position and ageism turns into dislike, disregard, abandonment, and ultimately, disposal. Jeffrey Rubinoff's sculptures offer us negative space in which we can fill with emotion and movement and music. What are we filling the void created by absent aged bodies on stage, I wonder? Art is a vehicle for social change and social reflection, and even in the lightest of comedies, cultural preferences are reinforced. These rules of society that articulate how people exist in relationship with each other. If ages bodies are absent on stage, does that say they don't have a place in that relationship? 
Now more than ever, artists must interrogate inferred cultural messages in words of expression to both respond to the deficit of older bodies in performance and underscore the impact that COVID-19 pandemic had on the social inclusivity of elders. Art tells stories. Research aims to understand and contextualize these stories. Theater, all art, must bear witness to the tragedy of being elderly in a crisis and must tell the stories of the older adults who tried to navigate a world in crisis where they had little value because of their statistical proximity to death. As artists, we are obliged to address the pandemic era social treatment of our older people, and more importantly, to rectify the void that the performing arts has created and endorsed in the representation of vibrant, interesting, older adults. Looping back to Thomas King, he said, all we are is stories, and if there are no stories about us, what are we? Thank you. <laughs>